I figured when you all saw me uh, walk up here, you'd, you'd figure it out. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Yom Geyer. I'm a deacon here at Northwest Church of Christ. And I was actually scheduled to preach on the 27th. Yeah, today's the 27th, uh, next Sunday. Uh, but we have our, is my microphone on? I'm sorry. Uh, on the 27th, but we, we have a, a guest speaker, Buddy Payne, coming in next weekend. So uh, if any of you have had the opportunity to see Buddy before, uh, Buddy is a fantastic preacher. Um, if you're able, I encourage you, uh, by any means necessary, by hook or by crook, uh, make it here next Sunday as well to see Buddy Payne. He is a fantastic preacher, and we're always blessed to have him here. So uh, I will be preaching this morning. Um, and as you can see by the uh, topic in the slide, uh, my sermon topic is, is loving God through trials and having joy in our trials. I'll be spending uh, uh, the beginning of my sermon and, and the end in James 1. So if that's easy enough for you to mark in your Bibles, that's where we'll begin and that's where we will end. Um, so life can feel out of control. You know, sometimes it even feels like everything is, is falling apart. Uh, and we realize pretty quickly when you become an adult um, that we control very little in our lives. Now, this has led to a lot of uh, folks in the world to... Um, make up a lot of solutions for this sort of thing. Um, the fact that all of you are here this morning in this building leads me to believe that you've realized that we really uh, have just one true solution, and that, that is God. Um, in, in James 1, I will start in verse 2. Uh, I'll read verse 2 through 8. Uh, because James addresses a lot of this for us and, and does it very well. Starting in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives it to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So, James, what... You, so what you're trying to tell us here, what James is trying to tell us is to have joy in our trials, uh, to count it all joy when we fall into these trials. And that's, that's a pretty tall order. And that's typically not our first reaction uh, when we fall into these worldly trials. Um, so, you know, I'll try not to be too mad at James, but it, um, what I wanted to do this morning is, is to sort of remind us that, that what James is saying is tough, but that, you know, we should have joy in our trials because they serve a purpose. And the last thing we should do during these trials is to turn away from God, which is and we'll discuss this in the sermon, a great temptation. Um, but to, in fact, do the opposite and turn toward God. That these trials um, will produce patience. <laughs> That's not an easy thing to hear either. Um, and, uh, and that we should have joy in those. Uh, 
Uh, like I said, joy may not be the first thing we feel. It may not be our first initial reaction. So I want to talk about some of those reactions that, uh, that may come up uh, initially when we have these trials. So one of the first things that can happen, and again, uh, I may have said this before in some of my other sermons, when I'm uh, thinking about a sermon or putting together a sermon, it's typically something that I need to hear. It's a sermon I'm giving to myself. So when these difficult times happen uh, in the world, financially, uh, our health, the health of a loved one, uh, just these difficult times, you know, anger can be one of the first things that we feel. It could be the first reaction that we have. Um, it's a response to some helplessness that we may have or frustration that we have that, that uh, this is happening, but it can be, you know, initially what happens. Um, for the last few years, many of you know that our son Colin has been hospitalized off and on, often, unfortunately. And, and, you know, that, that helplessness, um, that frustration um, can, can bubble up or manifest itself initially in anger. But Satan uses these trials as an opportunity, and we can't let him uh, take advantage of these trials. Remember, it, he's the adversary, and his goal is to... It, it's to destroy our joy that we have in God, and, and, and he, he wants to use these trials, this pain and this sort of thing, uh, to sometimes make us think that uh, God uh, isn't doing anything or, or isn't there for us and, and abandoning us. And remember, he, he's trying to destroy our joy and our faith in God. Um, and sometimes our anger reaches a point where we may lash out at others, and we may say things that we shouldn't. And this is, again, one of those uh, opportunities that Satan uses for us. But James, a few chapters over, addresses this as well. So I'm going to be reading from James chapter 3, and I'm going to start... Uh, with verse 5, it, it, uh, sort of in the middle of verse 5. Um, James chapter 3, and I'll read 5 through 8. See how great a forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. James is telling us directly where that comes from. For every kind of beast and bird and of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. And we can see that. Again in verse 8, but no man can tame the tongue. It is, it is unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be so. James is not mincing words. He's telling us the danger of the tongue, not that it is lightly dangerous, not that it is uh, possibly uh, causing some uh, discomfort. James is telling us directly that an unruly tongue is evil and is full of deadly poison. It's from hell, he says. So we should not be angry or blame God. Now, anger in itself, we can read, um, is not necessarily sinful. We can be angry, but do not sin. Uh, but we have to be very careful about the actions that that anger brings up in us. While Colin was in the hospital, we, we talked about Job quite a bit. 
Uh, and whenever we talk about patience or, or trials, typically Job is where we go. There's a reason for that. Um, because Job is a fantastic example. And, uh, and I'd like to discuss uh, Job here with us this morning. I want to read from the first chapter of Job. Uh, and if we remember, throughout the book of Job, Job, uh, his, talk about trials. Uh, Job is faced with trials. He's faced with uh, bad advice from those that he loves. Uh, and he is blessed to have a conversation with God. And I want to remind us that we are blessed to have that conversation written down so that we can uh, read through and understand God even more through his word. So I'm going to start in Job 1. I'm going to start in verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. This is a pretty typical day. But then... And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them when the Sabians raided, raided them and took them away. Indeed, they've killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So here we read that um, some of Job's enemies have raided and t taken away uh, his livestock, his oxen and his donkeys. And only and killed uh, his servants that were tending to those livestock and donkeys, and only one escaped that was able to come and tell Job. Now that sounds like a difficult situation, but while this servant was telling him, so I'll read in 16, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Now his sheep and the servants that were tending the sheep have been destroyed. But that's not all. Verse 17, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the Chaldeans have formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. His camels are gone. The Chaldeans have come and take them and killed all of his servants that were tending to his camels. But while this servant was still speaking, in 18 I'll read, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So we see in verse 13 that his livestock is killed, and the, the servants murdered that were attending to the livestock. Um, his sheep and the servants tending to those were burned up. Uh, the Chaldeans have come and, and taken his camels and murdered those servants. And then while his sons and daughters were meeting together in a house and eating and drinking, a wind came across and, and broke down the house, and the house fell and destroyed them. This all happened at once, and all came upon Job. Now, typically, and I, I know that Job was overwhelmed, typically, you know, Job's response may not be our typical response, but it should be. So let's take a look at how Job responded in verse 20. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In 22, in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Job strikes me as a man who was prepared 
before the calamity struck. He was prepared in his faith before these trials came on him. So Job did not ask why. He didn't lash out. And he was accepting of whatever was happening because in his faith he understood that God was in charge. So even, even later in Job, we see that he ignored the bad advice of, of his loved ones. And just in reading this scripture, we've benefited from the wisdom that's in this scripture. Think of how many believers read this scripture and have benefited. We have to think about those sorts of things in our reactions to these trials. Could our reactions, our correct reactions, benefit others? Uh, we read in James that they're going to benefit us, and we'll read that again at the end. Uh, but could they also benefit others? You know, what comes to mind uh, of, of those who are in pain and, and going through some of these trials, uh, some of you may remember uh, Mrs. Pauline Mudd. Uh, she worshiped with us for, for a while. Um, we even went and, and picked her up uh, for some time. Um, my wife, Ellen, even took her to some doctor's appointments. And she uh, uh, had some pretty painful conditions. While in the doctor's office, waiting for doctors, while they're examining her, which is uncomfortable, which is painful, in her pain, she was telling every single person she came across about God and inviting every person that would listen to services. And that's the sort of thing that I want to try to remember while in my trials. But pain, uh, anger isn't, isn't the only sort of initial reaction we can have. Sometimes we can just feel alone in these troubled times and during these trials. I want to remind us that these initial feelings that we have, and we can have all kinds of reactions and feelings to these trials, they can't necessarily be trusted because if we're feeling that things are so bad and you feel abandoned, um, we may feel that no one cares, even while others are reaching out to help us. Um, we may feel like no one's trying to help even while many others are trying to help us. Um, so we can't always trust those initial emotions that we have. And again, what does the adversary want us to feel? He wants us to feel alone. God does not. And, uh, you know, everyone has these moments of weakness, uh, certainly during these trials. But again, we have to keep our eyes toward God. Um, David shared these feelings with God. And that's a good example of what we should do. So um, I'm going to be reading from the 25th Psalm. Uh, here we see that David is telling God how he's feeling um, and going to God, giving these, uh, giving these troubles to the Lord. So Psalm 25, I'll start in verse 15, and I'll read 15 through 18. Verse 15 of Psalm 25. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. 16. Turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Look on my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. David is desperate here. He is desperate and he is telling God about his desperation. He is saying that he is desolate and afflicted. He's telling the Lord that the troubles of his heart have enlarged. And he's begging God to bring him out of his distress. He's asking God to remember him and look upon his afflictions and forgive all of his sins. David was faithful. He had the heart like God. He knew that God wouldn't abandon him. 
So when he's saying, look on my affliction and pain, he knows that. He's asking that in faith, just like James was telling us to do, to pray for wisdom with faith. David was asking for God to look on his affliction and his pain with faith. I'm going to uh, uh, turn over now to Psalm 62 uh, in just a moment uh, and read verse 8. But the fact of the matter is, even if truly everyone in the world did forsake you, if truly you were alone, remember when, when Christ uh, was crucified, uh, the apostles were scattered. Um, so even if everyone forsakes you and, and you are truly alone, God will never abandon you. God will never forsake you. So in Psalm 62, verse 8, it reads, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. So what is the answer? And I think, again, that we know that because you're here, that God is the answer, but it's good to remind ourselves. It's good to be prepared for these trials before they happen. Uh, so, you know, what should we do? So we should be strong in the knowledge of the word. Uh, we're even told that we should be strong in the knowledge of the word so that we are equipped to handle good times and bad times. The other thing is don't, don't be surprised that these trials are going to happen because we're reminded over and over in Scripture that we will face trials. So we shouldn't be surprised. Well, everything was going great. I'm doing fine. Why are these things happening to me? Those, that's vanity, and it's not helpful. Uh, Peter even says explicitly not to be surprised. So in 1 Peter chapter 4, um, you know, we need to be ready for whatever comes our way, knowing that these trials will come. Uh, remember that, that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. But in Christ, we have that reconciliation and that peace uh, that peace that surpasses all understanding, to know that these trials are temporary, but do not be surprised. Let's read in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to me, to you. We also read in Ecclesiastes 7, if you'd like to turn there as well, we also read there that Solomon a man who did pray for that wisdom and received it, as James told us to do, um, a man who received all wisdom, tells us what's going on. So in chapter 7 of Ecclesiastes, reading in verse 13, Consider the work of God. For who can make straight what God has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. We should be joyful then. But in the day of adversity, consider, surely God has appointed the one as well as the other, so that man can find out nothing that will come after him. God has set these things in order. This is part of his perfect plan, that we will have good times as well as difficult times, trials, because these trials have a purpose. Remember that in these trials, part of God's perfect plan is that we can seek comfort in the body. We can seek comfort from brothers and sisters. Um, and it is part of the commandment that we have for one another that when we are in days of prosperity, we can comfort those who are not. When we are in uh, uh, the day of adversity, others can comfort us. So uh, I'd like to read from 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, uh, where Paul starts off that epistle to the Corinthians talking about this comfort. I didn't count how many times he uses the word comfort, but we're about to read 
and you'll see it's a lot. In fact, he calls God the God of all comfort. I'll start in verse 3 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also will you partake of the consolation. So we see how many times Paul talks about comfort, that we can seek comfort in God, and then that comfort that we receive from God, so Paul's telling us that we'll receive comfort from God if we seek it. But with that comfort, we can also comfort others. And sometimes we are being comforted, and that benefits us all. Why? Because it's to the glory of God. It's for God's glory. It's part of his plan. So when we receive the comfort, it glorifies God. When we're comforting others, it glorifies God. When we're seeking comfort from God, it glorifies God. And it benefits us. Our trials have a purpose. Remember, they're not just to make things hard on us or some sort of unfair thing. That is, that is the wrong mindset. That is the double-minded man. Let's go back to James now. Let's go back to James 1, actually starting in, in verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So not only were we told to have joy, but we're told that the testing of our faith produces patience. So the purpose here is to help us grow. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Then in verse 5, we're told to pray for wisdom with faith that God is with us. So in verse 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives it to all liberally and without reproach. God is not mad at us for praying to ask for wisdom. If we pray to ask for wisdom, he'll give it to us liberally. But we're told that when we pray for this wisdom during our trials, the wisdom to handle this trial well, to, to be able to comfort others even during this trial, or be that good example to others. Remember Miss Pauline Mudd, during her pain, these difficult uh, examinations and those sorts of things, inviting everyone she saw to services, telling everyone she could see or that would listen about Jesus. Um, in, in verse 6, we're told, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. If we're doubting while we're praying, why should we get anything from the Lord? In fact, we're told we won't. And that is the wrong mindset and a dangerous mindset for us. We're told that this mindset, um, that we are double-minded men, unstable in all our ways. So, as these trials come up in our lives, and they will, as we see these trials come up in others' lives, and they will, we have to remember to keep our eyes toward God because God is the only answer. We have to rely on that peace that surpasses all understanding to know that these trials are temporary. For however long they last here, they are temporary. We have to remember that there's comfort in God. There's also salvation, which is freely given. 
and it's given uh, uh, freely to all, uh, and it, it gives us that peace that's beyond all understanding. But that peace is given only once we follow the commandments given to us by God. It's given to us when we do uh, what we're told in Scripture so that we can partake of the inheritance, uh, so that we can be with God in heaven. Uh, there'll be no pain or sadness or tears, no more of these trials. Um, so if you've not followed the gospel, if you've not obeyed the scripture, and you've not been baptized for the remission of your sins, and you'd like to receive that promise and that inheritance of heaven, will you please come forward while we stand and while we sing?